Hi, and welcome to this broadcast of Taming the Polar Bears ongoing uh, mental health education series. Um, today, we're going to have a look at understanding auditory and visual hallucinations. Now, th th these are two things that are really greatly misunderstood. Um, we mostly associate them with the um, schizophrenia. Um, now, as part of my bipolar experience, as I've explained many times before, um, I was type 1 bipolar and what's known by some as um, schizoid affected bipolar, which means I experienced some elements of schizophrenia, including auditory and visual hallucinations and psychosis. Now, psychosis is um, something I would like to address separately, um, though auditory and visual hallucinations are often, though not necessarily, connected with psychosis. <clears throat> now, um, you know, one of, one of the, when I started all my research, and I really wanted to upset the apple cart of what was the common understanding of many of the major and most common psychiatric disorders. Um, those included my own disorder, bipolar, schizophrenia, um, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, and one I haven't really gotten to yet because it's such a hot button topic, ADHD. Now, <clears throat> Um, when I started this in the beginning of 2013, I did an enormous amount of research, background reading, study, interviews uh, involving these different psychiatric disorders, or brain disorders, mood disorders, whatever we want to call them. And, um, you know, I, I looked into countless, countless case studies. And um, the group of people I ended up having the most uh, real empathetic, compassionate reaction to was people in the schizophrenic community. Um, now, I think I go through stigma, and I have, uh, but even that doesn't hold a candle to what people with schizophrenia will face. Um, there is more stigma, misconceptions, uh, downright myth involved with schizophrenia than any other um, brain disorder or mental health disorder or, or something that people suffer through. Um, no one gets it worse, more wrong than the psychiatric profession. Um, they are completely and tragically inept at properly diagnosing schizophrenia and treating schizophrenia. The track record, and this is very well documented, this is documented in 15-year um, empirical studies, 15 years of data, um, the track record, psychiatric pharmaceutical model of treating schizophrenia um, is doing more harm than good. That is borne out by the statistics. Um, psychiatric medications prescribed for schizophrenia will cause brain damage and in fact, uh, it can be demonstrated that they actually worsen many psychotic symptoms. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to have to get this video fixed. Um, so um, when I looked into how schizophrenic so-called schizophrenic people, and uh, I don't like to think of them as schizophrenic people. I prefer thinking of them as people with suffering from 
schizophrenia, um, symptoms associated with the concept of schizophrenia. Um, now, there are a number of symptoms, um, a number of things that will go on in, in the course of a person's experience with schizophrenia. Um, but the two we're going to look at today are auditory and visual hallucinations. Now, um, I've spoken to a, a very good number of people who, who have experienced this, uh, but I also have my own experience. I don't have to try to imagine what it's like as most clinicians and doctors and academics and scientists have to. Um, uh, you know, I, I have the experience of this, and I can recall all of these experiences like they happened yesterday. Now, um, my, I, I can't, I no longer describe most of my experiences because they're too difficult for most people to hear. And, um, but I will describe some of the more mild ones that uh, most fit. Um, in these, under the categories of the phenomenon of auditory and visual hallucinations. Um, now, my kind of current uh, bipolar episode, which technically has not gone into remission, <laughs> I've recovered a great deal. I, I live a pretty good life now. I, I, I'm you know, mentally stable in these things, but technically, because of some of the depressive fatigue symptoms, these are physiological symptoms, not psychological. Um, I am technically in the depressive phase. So this started, um, uh, well, it kind of started at the end of 2007, but the, the, the more difficult symptoms started in the summer of 2008. Um, now, there was, um, I was going through an enormous amount of financial stress. Um, my, my business as a photographer was not going well. Um, I, I was struggling to make house payments, mortgage payments, all these kinds of things. You know, I, I was enormously driven to succeed and I wasn't. So I was undergoing a great amount of stress and difficulty. And in bipolar, that often become something what is known as mixed episodes, elements of mania, uh, very high energy, high <laughs> oomph in the brain, I'll say, and depressive, uh, elements of depressive symptoms, very negative thoughts, self-destructive thoughts, um, very high irritability. And it's a real dangerous, toxic mix. And in that mix, in the summer of 2008, I had my first experience with auditory and visual hallucinations. Now, as I've explained at other times, I've, I've dealt with symptoms and episodes of bipolar most of my adult life, particularly uh, in my 30s. Um, and depressive episodes, many unipolar depressive episodes. Um, you know, I don't necessarily have to be <laughs> go through a manic phase to get, enter a depressive episode. Another one of those misconceptions about bipolar people and the symptoms. Um, and what I had, you know, you, 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 many of us just naturally learn coping mechanisms. You know, something's going on in our brain. Most of us don't seek the help, uh, but our brain has a wonderful way of seeking its own coping mechanisms. And what I'd found um, was sometimes if I just lay down and block things out, close my eyes, block things out, uh, I, whatever was going on would calm down. Sometimes I'd fall into a deep sleep and I'd wake up, feel a little rejuvenated, look at things a little differently and, and kind of get through that, that episode. So one day in, in this summer of 2008, in the middle of this, um, mixed 
and all the stress and all this stuff going on. Uh, I was having a really, really difficult time. It was a gorgeous sunny day. It was, you know, a lovely summer day. There was nothing wrong in the environment per se to trigger anything. Um, so I decided I'd, I'd just lay down try to block things out just my old technique and, and see if I could just sleep a little bit and and do what I had done before uh, however as I lay down you know I'm on top of the bed I go to the bedroom I'm on top of the covers and I'm, I'm laying there and I'm trying to close my eyes and block things out and suddenly I heard a voice now we're not talking, you know, the the, you know, the sound of our own voice in our head. Um, this is a common misperception of what hearing voices is. It, it it's not in your head. It's coming from somewhere else. Um, and I remember very distinctly the the room. Uh, I can remember visualize everything I was looking at in the room. And I'm lying down. I'm trying to close my eyes and block out all the stuff going on. And I suddenly heard this voice. It sounded like it was coming from up in the far corner, upper corner of the room. And um, it was a very angry, authoritative voice. And it was demanding that I do certain things. This is quite um, disconcerting, shall I say. Um, you know, I opened my eyes, you know, looking, trying to see where this voice is coming from. And I can't see anything. All I hear is this booming voice, just very authoritatively demanding that I do things. Um, meanwhile, I'm, I'm laying down on my side on the bed on top of the, the, the bed cover. And I see a large pool of blood, and here comes Mrs. Bean. I see a large pool of blood, blood spreading out over the duvet, and it, it, it's thick. Um, you know, if you've seen video, live, real video of, of gunshot wounds to the brain, to the head, or, or a slit jugular vein, it's it's thick. It's dark. And it's spreading out, look just like that. And um, you know, I'm hearing this voice and seeing blood spread out. Um, now I'm, I'm kind of somewhat blessed with a logical mind, so I'm thinking, okay, there's only one place blood of that volume and thickness could be coming from. I, I must have cut my jugular vein somehow. So, but this. <laughs> doesn't jive with anything I'd done in the previous five or 10 minutes. Like I came nowhere near a sharp object and, you know, my brain is struggling to comprehend what I'm seeing. And, um, you know, finally I, I reached out to touch it and I'm, I'm, I'm touching my neck, I'm touching the duvet and, and I, I can't feel anything. There's nothing on my fingers. And so eventually my brain kind of, you know, overcame this visual hallucination. Like my other senses told a different story than what my eyes were saying. And and the, the, the visual hallucination faded away, and then the voice faded away. This this lasted, well, it seemed like a long time. It probably lasted two or three minutes. And um, I, I came out of it and just, you know, my, my brain sort of started sorting things out and, and, you know, it turned to normal reality, we might say. Um, I just thought, what the hell was that? Um, that would happen several more times in the ensuing several weeks to a month. Um, each time it got a little less shocking and a little quicker before my mind could sort it out. I thought, okay, I've been through this before and my mind could kind of work through it. Like I was I'm kind of blessed in certain ways, which I'll get to a little later, and then will help make a little more sense about what's going on and why some people suffer these 
So that was the first time. Um, nothing happened for, for several years until 2010, two year, well, not several years, two years later. Um, I, I was working in a, in a very high pressure, fast paced um, um, home in, um, indoor home manufacturing facility. I was had a managerial position there. I was kind of in charge of a lot of different projects and things there, very high pressure. I'm going to come back to this concept of pressure a little later. Um, now at that time, I'd already been diagnosed with bipolar. I'd been to the hospital. I was on medications. And so, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I'm doing the right thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm taking my medications. This is what the, the, the you know, everybody talks about. Just take your medications. Everything will be okay. Well, things were not okay for me. Um, the hallucination started again. I won't get into them in a whole lot of detail, but I'm, I'm working in a, um, you know, facility that, that, deals with with manufactured wood products and as such I'm um, you know it's kind of the lead hand in operating all the most heavy dangerous machinery uh, I'm very well trained I'm very good at what I do I'm very confident very experienced and I'm uh, on one occasion I'm operating a very large table saw, large circular blade in the middle of the table, vertical blade. Uh, there's a fence, and I'm pushing lumber through through the blade in order to mill it to size. Um, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm satisfied. I enjoy my work. I'm having a good day, and I'm pushing lumber through. And suddenly, I look down. Uh, my hands are gone. They're severed. Uh, one is on the table. One fell down to the shop floor. Uh, blood is everywhere. And, uh, you know, this was much more disconcerting than uh, my previous experience because, you know, before I couldn't figure out, you know, I wasn't around anything dangerous that could have cause the type of wound that would lead to that kind of loss of blood. Uh, but now I'm working with, you know, large spinning blade. And even though I'm doing everything perfectly according to the operation of the machine, I've somehow cut both hands off. Um, you know, I'm in a state of shock. Like I'm staring in disbelief. I'm looking at two stubs. My hands are on one, one, like I say, one is on the table, one is on the floor. Blood is pouring everywhere. And I can't comprehend what just happened. Instinctively, I reach down and hit the off button for the machine. Now, as I do that, again, my senses tell a different story. I can feel my, my fingers touch the off button. And as the the machine wound down, um, you know, my, again, my brain started putting two and two together. The, the competing senses worked themselves out to complete the proper picture of reality. And, and again, the, the, the hallucination faded away. And, um, but, uh, you know, I had so many other psychiatric difficulties going on and and it's so out of the blue it's so disconcerting and I'm you know I'm working in a shop with very dangerous machinery um, it, it suddenly didn't make sense to be there um, so I didn't say anything to anybody I had a very good relationship with my boss a very fortunate relationship he kind of understood sometimes I just needed to go home so I just I just went to the car and went home and and tried to wrap my head around what had just happened. Um, now, several other incidences like that took place that same summer. And again, I'm taking medications. I'm doing every, I'm under psychiatric care at this time. I'm doing everything they tell me to do. And these hallucinations keep happening. 
so you know there, there there's a kind of a long story to follow that and many more hospitalizations all kinds of things um all kinds of deteriorating conditions that i don't need to get into today um and then in the meantime you know aside from these 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 visual and auditory hallucinations that i'd been experiencing i'd started having episodes of psychosis which is i say kind of a different little bit different kettle of fish and um these all got worse um you know the the, the psychiatric and mental health system is throwing everything they have at me and when things continued to get worse and i had my worst episode at the very tail end of 2012 um that's when i said to hell with psychiatry to hell with pharmaceutical drugs and i started my famous somewhat famous quest for why now as i've explained in in different interviews and other posts and um you know i've mentioned this many many times if you're familiar with me you're familiar with what i'm about to say um you know psychiatry psychology um nobody had the answers i wanted to know why i had auditory and visual hallucinations i mean my you know we're not stupid us people who suffer these things you know something's going on and nobody can tell us why nobody can tell us how to stop them nobody under make helps us understand why we're having these crazy experiences they just keep shoving their prescriptions at us take the pills it's all we can do take your medications be a good boy or girl take your medications um well i'm sorry that the data does not back up that up there's there's no evidence whatsoever that the medications actually have long term efficacy or benefits for those suffering from these symptoms and conditions and again long term data will back that up so this is what i found out so i wanted to know why that's why i took up neuroscience that's why i went on this mad quest to learn everything there is to know about the brain what it does why it does it why does it do things wrong and um, that's what we're going to have a look at today now as i've said and i'm not going to present all the background proof and evidence for this today um, the psychiatric and pharmacological model gets understanding of these symptoms and um, how they manifest themselves in people in their lives um, so horrifically and seriously tragically wrong um, it borderline in my view criminal um now when i started investigating the world of schizophrenia and and some of these symptoms um i i did an enormous amount of reading i looked at a great number of case studies um and i came across an organization um, this was started by a Dutch psychiatrist in the early 1990s. The name escapes me right now, but you, you can find that out by going to the website for the Hearing Voices Network. and it was through the hearing voices network and enormous amount of work they've done working with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people the story of how all this came to be is very fascinating and interesting and insightful in its own right um, but we get to myth number one regarding hearing voices. Hearing voices does not mean you have schizophrenia. Um, what the 
psychiatrist, this Dutch psychiatrist discovered in the early 1990s as he was working on a research project was that there were hundreds and hundreds of people who experienced hearing voices but who led perfectly normal lives and they lived in terror that they were going to be diagnosed with schizophrenia if they ever revealed that they were hearing voices that they would get diagnosed with schizophrenia and forced to take psychiatric medications and suffer all the stigma that comes with the the um, diagnosis of schizophrenia um, those who do suffer that will lose unemployment opportunity or sorry lose employment opportunities um, normal relationship opportunities. It is um, almost literally life destroying. And um, so they lived in terror and underground um, trying to hide this experience of hearing voices. Um, the psychiatrist discovered this. Um, he was a very smart psychiatrist. He actually listened. He listened to these people. He organized large meetings of them, and he heard what they had to say, and this became his whole new direction, or sorry, this became a whole new direction for him that would lead to the Hearing Voices Network. Um, I came across this now. I, 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 did, I read just about everything available, uh, on on the psychiatrist's work, background, um, and, and subsequent research, and and um, it's not to me. It's not just research. You know, we think of research. We think of data and all this stuff that has no human meaning at all. Um, you know, I mean, I I look through you know what these people had to say, what they lived with, the fear and terror they lived with. Like, imagine that. You know, you're perfectly, otherwise perfectly normal, healthy human being going about your life, and you live in abject terror. And this creates a fear and an anxiety in itself that have nothing wrong with them other than they experience auditory hallucinations. Um, now, one of the things, and there's, again, there's enormous amount of research, um, counter study, we shall say, to the psych psychiatric model of things in the inept psychiatric industry, um, where people have been forcefully hospitalized because they report hearing voices. They have no other symptoms, nothing's going on. They're, they're perfectly normal otherwise. They just say that they're hearing voices. There was a large study and I have to find, it's, I wanna say it's comical, but it's not because, um, you know, a research scientist in the field of psychology um, thought he would test psychiatry's ability to diagnose schizophrenia. So he um, uh, engaged the help of, of 12 graduate students who would report to going to different psychiatric hospitals and report hearing voices. Now, these are all perfectly normal people. They had no other symptoms. They complained of no other symptoms. They just simply said that they heard voices. And, you know, what happened in these 12, I believe it was 12, it might have been 15 different cases where people just walk into a psychiatric hospital and, and, claim they hear voices um, was astonishing. Now, these are people who are perfectly healthy, healthy, no other symptoms. They exhibited no other symptoms. They, they didn't fake anything any other than saying that they heard voices. And they went into this, some of them went into psychiatric hospital hell. There are other stories that verify that similar thing. So, 
again, auditory hallucinations, hearing voices, does not necessarily mean you're schizophrenic. Now, it's true, hearing voices might be one of the symptoms of schizophrenia. Emphasis on might be one of the symptoms of schizophrenia, but the two are not necessarily connected. Now, uh, what, what Hearing Voices Organization, the Hearing Voices Network, and I encourage you to look into the Hearing Voices Network, I'm not going to be able to get into that today, uh, was that people also experienced visual hallucinations without necessarily having a psychiatric disorder. Well, I became very fascinated with this, that the Hearing Voices Network, I, I looked them up, and um, lo and behold, there was a chapter in uh, the city closest to me, Vancouver, BC, Canada. I contacted them, they had regular weekly meetings. I went and, um, you know, the feeling I had sitting down with calm, rational people who could discuss these, these sort of sometimes separate, sometimes twin phenomenon of auditory and visual hallucinations without shame, without guilt, without judgment, without having some doctor try to push a diagnosis on you and make you take drugs. These are all people who experience these things. Um, they'd been involved in the Hearing Voices Network for a period of time. Um, there was an excellent, excellent facilitator, and we could just simply share our experiences in a open, comforting, non-judgmental environment. And I cannot possibly explain to you how good that felt, how relieving it felt, how to good it felt to share these experiences that I couldn't share with anybody else. And to just have a, 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 an interesting conversation on what they were all about, what it felt like, what we would do, and so on and so forth. Um, the benefit to the, the researcher, me, was I got more insight into other people's experiences with hearing voices. Um, sometimes hearing voices can be connected with suicidal thoughts. Um, other people's experiences of visual hallucinations and so on. Okay, so that's a bit of an introduction into auditory and visual hallucinations and getting a little bit of a separate understanding of them from the psychiatric, pharmaceutical, chemical imbalance, blah, 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 diagnostic and statistical manual understanding. Okay, so um, now as I said, um, I, I got some very interesting information and, and you know, more insight into other people's experience and of, of hearing voices and visual hallucinations. Um, but that still didn't satisfy my question. <laughs> like, where the hell do these things come from? So, that takes me and us back to the study of neuroscience and why I love the study of neuroscience. I don't, well, I enjoy the study of neuroscience, but I, I study neuroscience because I'm looking for answers. You know, this isn't some grant proposal to me or, you know, it's my job as a scientist to go into some lab at a university and pass my time making interesting experiences or experiments so I can get grant and research money and put food on the table. I have a driving, burning desire to actually find the answers to these things uh, because of the real world suffering that people go through. Now, I happen to actually be pretty lucky. I can look back on my story and it was kind of horrific in a lot of ways, but uh, my story doesn't hold a candle to what many people go through because of misdiagnosis, misunderstanding, stigma, uh, re societal rejection that is beyond anything you could possibly imagine unless you've been through it. So 
my motivation for understanding these things and my burning desire to find answers is a little different than the average scientist who just wants a research grant so he can publish papers and become famous or whatever. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> not always very fond of the scientific community. <laughs> nice people and they come up with some interesting things, but their motivations are a little different than mine. Okay, so neuroscience. So one of the things uh, now, when we study what the brain does, one of the kind of cool mind-bending things it does, and, and this is why I write, um, I have a specific blog post on reality. It, it's very short, simple. Um, it doesn't nearly cover the subject the way it needs to be covered, but it gives a fairly adequate introduction. Um, is the bizarre concept that almost that most people have a very hard time wrapping their minds around is that our the reality we experience and when we flash awake and even when we're dreaming all that is created by this 3.1 pound mass that's kind of like the consistency of bean curd it's full of 90 billion some odd neurons, trillions upon trillions of synapses, all this basic stuff that I talk about in the um, my introductory neuroscience post, um, Neuroanatomy 101. Um, what we experience as reality is created by this. Bizarre concept, but bear with me. Um, to to get back to you know, realities, <laughs> how our brain creates reality is a very big subject, so I don't want to get too sidetracked. Um, what's of relevance here? I'll, I'll switch colors here. What's of relevance to us in understanding auditory and visual hallucinations is how our brains create sound and sight. And again, this is a little bit too big of a topic to get into today. And I, I have to get to a different broadcast on, on reality and all this stuff. Um, but just briefly, now sound, what, what we perceive a sound, the sound of my voice, when you turn on the radio, the sound of the music coming through the speakers. Um, you know, you go to a concert, the, the sound you hear in the concert hall, you go outside and you hear the sound of traffic and you hear the sound of birds or, you know, whatever, all these things that we can hear. Um, you know, we associate that with our ears. You know, we'll, we'll say, you know, a good musician has a good ear for this or that. Well, the, 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 our ears, you know, sound, you know, there's the, the sound waves. There's the whole physics to sound waves. The physics of sound waves is very, very complex. I touch on that in my post on, on the neuroscience of um, music therapy. But, but um, you know, sound waves are just bouncing around. There's different frequencies. There's high frequencies. There's low wave frequencies. And there's many sounds that we can't hear because they're below our, our auditory system ability to, to translate into a sound. You know, and there's different animals that can hear sound that, that's below the, the wavelength, and I'm, I'm not a physics person, I, I'm a music buff, and I somehow manage not to understand all these different measuring systems for, for sound waves. But uh, there's creatures that can hear things below in sound frequencies below what we can hear, what we can perceive. And there's creatures and Dogs are famous for this. You know, you blow a dog whistle, it's silent to us, but they can hear it. And that, that these are above sound frequencies above. So 
you know, the, what, what the human, <laughs> even I want to say ear, what the human ear <laughs> can hear as sound uh, does not even um, uh, contain or the, the entire uh, sound wavelength uh, frequency range, shall we say. So, you know, our ears are just like little radars. They they just they just collect these sound waves. You know, that this let me just take this off. This little flap of skin, you know, just helps gather the sound waves. Now, Mrs. Bean just so happens to be oddly curled up on my desk over here. So she's so so make a handy, handy, you know, like she she has ears. Her ears are very, you know, cats, you know, if you watch them, see so, so her ears, will, cats have this ability to move their their ears around these little radar dishes so they can catch sound waves. And what's importantly, the direction they're coming from. Cats use hearing for hunting and things in ways we don't. So their ears are, are you know, dogs are a little bit similar, but cats mostly. So anyways, they just collect sound. Now, what we experience as sound, it's not created in our ear, our whole, like this outer ear flap thing, the inner ear channel, all that stuff, probably most of you are at least somewhat familiar with the little inner ear and the little bones and the hairs and stuff. That just translates the sound waves electrical signals that travel to an area in our brain called the, the one each side of our brain and there's all kinds of complex wiring involved but where we where sound is created is in the auditory cortex and again what the human ear hears our reality of sound is not a universal reality. Different critters have different mechanisms for translating bouncing sound waves into a sound that to them makes sense for their survival. Humans just happen to have a somewhat evolved sense of sound. A big part of that being our ability to enjoy and create music. That's why I write about music therapy so much. But this is all created, what we experience as sound. All these sounds I described earlier are actually created in our auditory cortex where a number of very specialized neurons and groups of neurons will respond to certain you know, what we call notes or tones, uh, low sounds, high sounds, timber, all these things. And I get into that a little bit in the post on music therapy. So, um, you know, this is kind of ties into how our brains create reality. Again, what we experience as sound is just the human experience of sound and even the human experience of sound has an enormous amount of variability between different humans. <clears throat> so, what we hear as sound is not necessarily a universal reality. We experience it as reality in our minds. If we hear a sound, we just assume that's it, that's that sound. But in reality, <laughs> objective reality, in a broader objective reality, that same particular sound wave that has this particular frequency and all these really complex properties of physics that I kind of get into a little bit in the post on music therapy, depending on all kinds of differences in the, the neuronal networks and pathways and so on in our auditory, um, auditory cortexes, we will experience them differently. Same is true with sight. 
Now, sight, as I explain in the post on reality, uh, you know, what we experience as sight, it is human-centric. Um, all animals perceive sight of the, you know, the, the visual, their visual world, we'll call it, a little bit differently or vastly differently. Um, as you may or may not know, light has all kinds of different wavelengths, and again, I, I lack the proper terminology on, on uh, but they're, they're basically little photons. You know, when we look at the color of this room, these colors are not the color. They just happen to be how the human eye perceives them. And again, uh, this depends on a few things, a few specialized receptors in, in the, the the retina of our eyeballs, uh, but like the ear, they just happen to be able to collect all these photons, these light photons that bounce around, bounce off everything, and our eyes collect those photons, convert them into electrical signals. Um, I, I need a brain diagram here. I'll have to use my own head. You know, here, here's my eyeballs here, but our eyeballs don't create what we experience as sight. Like again, they're just kind of raw data collectors and that gets, they translate that into electrical impulses that travel through our optic nerve back to the back of our brain where the octopical lobe resides and that is where what we experience as sight is created. And again, the, the typical lobe, open your eyes and, and you're gathering in whatever is around you. And it has this nice 3D look to it. There's all kinds of weird things that your brain, your typical lobe has to assemble to create what you experience as sight. Again, these are all specialized neurons, specialized jobs, or specialized networks. It all happens literally at lightning speed. Um, you know, as you know, light, the speed of light and the speed of sound are two entirely different things. Um, you hear a, a, a uh, you see a lightning flash and then hear the thunder clap several seconds later, you know, that's several kilometers or miles away. Uh, your brain doesn't quite sync those up. But the truth is, even at shorter distances, you know, if you're um, listening to a speaker in a large room and um, he's perhaps... Uh, let's say about 20 meters, 60 feet away, um, that, that, that their image will reach you, reach your eyes before the sound waves do. But your brain cleverly takes these two competing signals and syncs them so that you perceive them as happening simultaneously. Or, or sorry, that they reach you simultaneously. If your brain didn't did this, sorry, didn't do this, it would look like a, a badly dubbed movie where the person's mouth is moving and the sound doesn't sync up. So your brain has to do all these things. And, you know, again, what, what the brain, you know, what our auditory cortex creates a sound and our, our typical lobe creates vision is part of what creates what we perceive as reality. Now, so when we look at auditory and visual hallucinations, um, we start to bump up against you know, what we think of as common or, or consensual reality. Now, um, back to my hallucinations, for example. Now, I'm sitting there in the shop. I just cut my arms off. Uh, that's what I'm seeing. I mean, that's real to me because that's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like I'm, it's real as, as I'm looking at anything in this room right now. It's what, I am seeing. Uh, if there's somebody standing next to me 
and I start freaking out. Oh my God, I cut my hands off and I'm, I'm in a panic. And fortunately not the panicky type. So I don't do stuff like that. It's one of the reasons I suffer from them, suffered from them less and less persistently. Um, they're not going to see what I see, obviously. They're going to see you know, two complete hands, no blood. They're going to wonder what the hell is going on. So this is where we, we're in a, 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 an understanding of how our brains create reality and how we perceive reality is really important to understanding something like auditory and visual hallucinations. And this is where we have to understand our sub objective experience of reality and what what's you know this is a really I get into some conversations with science types this is a really difficult subject that can get taken to the extremes but just for now what we'll understand is consensual or common reality if if you know if I don't cut my you know if I see that I've cut my arms off, but I obviously didn't according to anybody else in the same room, for example, and if they were in that shop with me, you know, our experiences of reality would be very different. And theirs, of course, would be correct. But what I'm perceiving, what I perceived in my mind, because I'm just merely going by what, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing or hearing is entirely different. This is going to be really interesting to try and understand the world of a schizophrenic person or a person who experiences auditory and visual hallucinations. Nobody understands you. This is why the hearing voice network was such a godsend and is such a godsend to so many people. It's like, oh my God, somebody who understands my world. So, now I, I think we can all put two and two together. When somebody is experiencing auditory and visual hallucinations, something's going on in their auditory cortex and a, a typical lobe to create this kind of what we'll just call it a, a misconstrued reality because to them and I, I can tell you this from my own experience it's as real it's as real as anything it appears real one of the women I got to know and shared stories with in, in these weekly meetings of the Hearing Voices Network in Vancouver, she would say, you know, she'd just be out in an ordinary day. And I remember the one story she told. She's um, going to a um, shopping mall of some kind, one of these normal kind of strip mall shopping malls, large parking lot and several retail outlet buildings and um, you know and she could just see the place one one particular structure burst into flame and flames everywhere you know it's terrifying you know like you know you, you know anybody would be terrified except she's the only one seeing it and that becomes terrifying on its own you know when when we you know, this is where, you know, schizophrenia is, is sometimes kind of linked with, with, you know, breaking from reality. And um, it's, you know, it's a frightening experience. It, it, it's, there, there can be literally no more lonely experience. Um, when it's extremely hard to figure out. And, um, and this is what drives me in my research and my desire to study and talk about these things and try to create a better and different understanding of what's going on and why. Um, you know, it, it's that fear, it's that isolation, it's that lack of connection and understanding in anybody that creates a great deal of the mental turmoil. And when I get to the end, we'll, we'll tie all this back into how this creates a large part of 
we experience, perceive as a disorder. Um, now, so I, I understood what I just explained to you. I understood that very quickly back in well, over four years ago. But, you know, it still wasn't the final piece of the puzzle. I still, you know, why, you know, what happens in our brain? Like I say, we're, we're basically talking, you know, the auditory cortex and, and the you know, typical lobe. You know, that's where these, these sensations, these phenomenon, these auditory visual, uh, visual hallucinations are created, you know, just like they create all our reality, but something is going on to create something that no one else can see. So what could that be? So for four years, you know, I understood basically what was going on. I understood, um, I, I, as I understood more about stress response, and I'll get to that in a, in a brief moment, what there was a missing piece of this puzzle that's been driving me crazy and it wasn't till two o'clock in the morning very recently talking with somebody who's been following my blog and i'm trying to explain uh, and i've been talking with this person for a while and she's got all kinds of excellent questions she wants to know about free will and reality and all these interesting things she's coming across she's learning these through my blogger and then going off and finding podcasts and all kinds of interesting YouTube videos on this stuff. So I, I'm trying to explain my, my own experience. <laughs> you know, you, you don't know difficult till you try to explain this to somebody. You'll, you'll, you'll get just complete and utter, you know, there's just no understanding. They have no concept what you're talking about at all. So I quickly kind of realized I was running into a, 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 a quicksand pit there. Um, but some in that conversation sparked something else because we I'd been explaining to her this kind of in this business of reality and how our brains create all these things and are specialized neurons for this and that. I had been explaining to this young woman the concept of oops phantom limb syndrome. And in, in, in trying to, to, to you know my <laughs> trying to get this woman to comprehend what I'm talking about when, when I'm, you know, seeing things, you know, but obviously they're not there, but they're so real to me. And, and, you know, this is really hard to get people to understand. And then I remembered I, I've done uh, quite a bit of reading and, and looking into the neuroscience of phantom limb syndrome. Oh boy, this is another big topic. I don't want to get it. In. Oh my God, I'm coming up on close to an hour already and you're probably bored out of your mind, but bear with me. We're getting there. Phantom limb, sim uh, limb syndrome. Uh, now this has been kind of studied and recognized and poked at and observed um, roughly. And I'm trying to think of the time of Napoleon and, and um, um, we'll, we'll just say some of the great European wars of the, the 17th century, 16th, 17th, 17th century, I think. You know, in a whole field, I've got an interesting book on some of the field surgeons, like some of the greatest advancements in medical science history and neuroscience history took place on the battlefields of Europe and these incredibly weird, intrepid individuals who wanted to study brain injuries and all these things going on with horrifically damaged soldiers and so on. It was the greatest lab experiment in history and we can't do that anymore. It's not ethical to <laughs> blow people up and examine them. But anyway, the doctors back then had this opportunity. Uh, so you know, what, what one of the biggest thing field surgeons had to do back then was amputate 
blown up limbs or, or they're blown up and gangrene and all kinds of horrific things set in. So they have to cut off the arm and, and it was, it was pretty brutal back then. It was just sawed off. No anesthetic. You know, you had to bite something. Other men had to hold you down. They just saw your arm off. Uh, they did cauterize it with a red hot iron, just sear the whole thing. It's a little bit traumatic, as you can well imagine. That word traumatic will come back in a second. So, anyways, they 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 do this, and you know, the body's an amazing thing. It heals from all kinds of horrific stuff. You know, the 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 iron, you know, was painful, obviously, but it did the job. It, burned all the damaged tissue and it sealed the open wound into the stump that would scar over and you know a year later would just you know be you know scar tissue and skin and you know the damaged gangrious arm is gone but many people with the limb is gone they can still feel the searing pain in a hand that is no longer there. Very bizarre. For 200 years, this mystified everybody. How the hell can you feel pain in something that's not there? So without too much ado, and this is going to be, uh, this is a fascinating way to understand the brain and pain, people which happens to rhyme. Uh, and, and, and this is going to be something I tie into a lot of ways. We experience psychological pain. When we can understand pain in these terms. A lot of things start to make sense. We're not going to get, all to, get to all that today. So phantom pain, pain. Where? How can there be pain in something that's not there? You know, the person is complaining, like some were talking searing, agonizing pain. If their hand was kind of blown off by some kind of artillery or something, bomb or grenade or something, and then and it's gone, how the hell can it still hurt when it's not there? And, and the people are going through agonizing pain. Of course, there's nothing doctors can do. They do stupid things. They keep cutting it off more and more. They start off down here. And they think, well, we'll have to try to cut more off. You do all these stupid things. People end up with nothing because the doctors keep trying and futile to make this pain stop. And they think by more, but the pain is still there. And the answer is that we you know, the, the, the pain that we experience as pain is just some kind of stimulus at the point. If I take a, you know, burning cigarette and stuff it in my hand, that's going to activate little cells in my skin and a little deeper into the derma. And um, that's going to send signals up the nerves. And that's going to end up activating some brain cells, specialized brain cells in a specialized region for this part of my body. And that's going to create the sensation we experience as pain. This is going to tie back to what we just learned about sight and sound people. 